While watching Nadia Comaneci in the 1976 Olympics, Kim Hamilton fell in love with gymnastics. She began flipping in her grandmother's living room in Richmond, Virginia. From sidewalk acrobat to world-class gymnast, Kim would go on to become UCLA's first African-American female gym champion. Other chapters of her story highlight a woman who has continually overcome unfavorable odds. She's here today with some Florida sunshine and 80 degrees back there in Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, Kim. it's pretty nice back there. And it's chilly here, very chilly. Chilly is an understatement. An understatement. Yes. So thrilled Thank to you. have read your story. It, mm. it's, uh, I said at the beginning, and it's true. It's the kind of story movies are made of. Mm. Thank you, Maura. Any talk of that? There is talk of that. Look at that, you so, see? We will see what God has in store. Mm -mm. Well, let's tell some of this story because it's the kind of thing that brings hope, uh, mm. whatever place uh, life finds you in. Uh, Richmond, Virginia was where you grew up. Yes, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and I was surrounded by drugs, violence, financial hardships, and I found myself in a place where many kids in the inner city find themselves. You had a very With young mom. Very young mom a teenage mom and teenage father and uh, could have been were, an abortion there yes and uh, there were abortion attempts because they didn't want me to be born into this world of um, a depressed circumstances I should say mm -hmm. your mom and dad did marry they did shortly after I was born they got married and my father served in the military US military so we traveled overseas to Germany during my early years, German was actually my first language. Really, you <laughs> learned I was it. Good yes, for I you. Did. I've got a little picture of you here in the book. Oh. On your third birthday, oh, yes. 1971. This one with the birthday cake. Look at yes. that little sweetie. <laughs> uh, and and there's, there are significant influences and moments. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your dad encouraged your gymnastics. He did. When we were in Germany, when I was just a little toddler, he would come home from work and he would teach me how to do handstands and headstands and forward rolls and things like that. So I think that's where it all started. That was the real starting place. Mm -hmm. And then really impressive sacrifices on the part of, yes. well, all of you, so well, that you could have gym classes. Mm -hmm. Gymnastics is a very expensive sport and we did not have the money to uh, put me into lessons and for me to train or anything like that. And what we had to do was be creative, innovative, and we had to think of ways to raise money or to come up with the funds so that I could train and travel around the country and around the world eventually. And one of the things we did were we set up a coat check stand at a nightclub. And I'm, what, 13 years old, so I'm in this dark nightclub. It's smoky. And, and we set this stand up and we had people pay maybe a dollar or two and at the end of the night probably midnight one o'clock in the morning I got under the disco ball on the wooden floors and I performed gymnastics routines so that they could see where their money went isn't that innovative yes yes I think we raised around five hundred dollars that night and then you walked home yes we did not have a car the buses weren't running then so we ended up walking home about 10 miles and 10 we yes miles in the dark in the dark and we didn't get home until sunrise and it was cold <laughs> see what i mean about the movie material i mean this is and didn't you all clean a gym Again, to help support your gift. Yes, and your I training. was. I was so blessed by the owners of the gym, Gordon and Judy Shaw, that they let us clean the gym to help pay for my lessons. So after I would train, I would finish about ten o'clock at night, and then we would go clean the gym. And sometimes we cleaned it until twelve, one o'clock in the morning. Sometimes we'd wake up at five o'clock to get it done before work and and school. My parents worked very hard. It was a sacrifice, but I think it was well worth it. I'm grateful for what they did. We have a couple of pictures from the book of uh, mm -hmm. the growing, maturing gymnast. Let's take a look at these. Ooh, oh. this looks like a oh. champion moment. That was in 1984. It was the Coca-Cola Invitation in London, and the two gymnasts on the side had just competed in the Olympics, in the 84 Olympics, and I won the floor exercise title at that competition. Congratulations, a little late from this end of Thank things. Thank you. Wow, and you're older here. Yes, this is me. I was probably a senior and competing on the balance beam, doing a signature move, balancing on one arm. <laughs> there. Wow, look at the muscles. <laughs> now, you know, I hate to, 
I hate to go to the negative, but mm. while you're learning all of these wonderful moves, uh -huh. you are also very early, uh, like uh, age six, your dad's teaching you how to roll joints. Right, right. Age 13, you learned how to make crack cocaine at mm. home. Well, it wasn't at home. I was at a drug dealer's home. A drug dealer's home. And um, this was totally apart from my father. This was just something that I wanted to do because I thought that if I learned how to handle drugs, that I would have some significance in my father's eyes. Was this not enough, the gymnastics, the, the work you were well, pulling together for? You know, what seemed to, in my young eyes, when I was rolling joints for my father, it seemed as if he was proud of me. So mm -hmm. I equated that with having value in his eyes. Mm -hmm. And when I was 13, I thought if I could make, learn how to make this new drug, you know, at the time it was crack cocaine, then he would be proud of me. He had no idea that I was in a drug dealer's house learning how to do this. Oh. And he would have been very upset had he known. Oh, well that's, that's But that was different. just my mindset. Mm. Unfavorable odds. You've been educating us a little about the, the sport. What about you made you the wrong stuff, traditionally? For gymnastics? Yeah. Well, I was African American, and back in the 70s, you didn't see, see African American. Right, exactly. I, there were no uh, gymnasts that I looked up to who were my skin tone. Uh, I was 5'7", I'm 5'7", which is tall for a gymnast. Most gymnasts hover around 4'11", 5 feet. Mm -hmm. And usually they say a gymnast is tall if she's 5'2", or 5'3". And um, I came from the wrong or the different type of background. I didn't come from a middle class family or affluent family. As you said, and it's an expensive sport. It, it, it is an expensive sport. And while I was walking home 10 miles after raising money to uh, compete and to train, my teammates, they were in their beds sleeping, mm -hmm. nice and warm. So I had a lot of struggles. So much sacrifice and emotional turmoil mm -hmm. despite the success, your self-worth did right. suffer. Yes, I um, went from getting my value uh, based on my handling drugs, you know, thinking that it'll please my father, to having athletic success determine my value. Yeah. But still, that wasn't enough. And I realized over the years that, you know what, I had this void, of course, and, and that void was the fact that I didn't have a relationship with God. And I came into that relationship my sophomore year in college. My now husband is the young man who shared it with me when we were dating. And um, of course, it changed my life. It changed my life. And as I developed my relationship with my Heavenly Father, I came to realize that I needed to get my relationship with my earthly father on track so that I could completely heal from all that had happened to me in my youth. Depression. Yes. Stalked you, mm -hmm. particularly at those special yeah. seasons like yes. Christmas. Christmas, Thanksgiving, oh. those holidays. I remember one Christmas when um, my father sometimes would not show up for holidays, Thanksgiving or Christmas. Even though he lived with us, he would disappear on occasions, sometimes weeks at a time. And, and this one particular Christmas where he didn't come home, my mother had wrapped up several beautiful presents, put them under the tree, and of course it was a sad Christmas yet again because my father wasn't there and, and we didn't know where he was. But when I went and opened those presents, beautifully wrapped, I'm, uh, Maura, it was just incredible. I was so excited, but when I opened them up, all I found were little notes about the size of, you know, this little paper, and, and on those notes were written the things that my mother would have bought me if she had the money oh, to do so. Oh dear, heartbreaking. Yeah, so Christmases are, were very difficult for me, very mm -hmm. difficult, even to the point in my marriage, you know, I have two children and uh, my husband loves to play Christmas songs and I would get depressed. I would have to leave grocery stores if I heard Christmas carols on there. I would have to excuse myself from our living room and go upstairs to my room because I couldn't handle the Christmas music. And I would um, just make myself endure it for my children. But it was very difficult. Isn't that interesting? In the mm -hmm. midst of blessing, yes. we have a picture of you with your handsome husband <laughs> um, and beautiful children. Uh, you, you were still plagued by that open yes. wound. This yes. is Corwin on the left with you. Mm -hmm. And 
This couple on the right, I yes. think they wrote the foreword to your book. They did. Tony and Lauren Dungy wrote the foreword for us, and, and they are an incredible model of Christ's love and care for people. Hmm. Your husband has an interesting athletic track record as well. Oh, yeah. Very Tell us athletic. What he was doing when you met him. Uh, he was playing football when I met him, and we actually, he says the first time we met each other was in the weight room at UCLA. Um, but I only remember meeting him when we were tutoring together. All the athletes had to tutor at a certain time, and he was in my tutoring group. So that's how we met. And Corwin has worked with Promise Keepers. You're currently yes. both involved with Athletes in Action. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to that open wound, because yes. God never leaves us there, does no, he? He doesn't. He provides a way. Mm -hmm. How did you know? I mean, your first surprise was that God had a plan for your life. Right. That was really amazing to you, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was huge because I thought that my life was a mistake. I mean, mm -hmm. I was an unwanted child. My mother tried to abort me, didn't work, and I had everything going against me. But yet, I came to realize that God doesn't make mistakes. So um, I, I was writing my story. My husband encouraged me to write my story because he thought people would benefit it mm -hmm. from it. and. Um, it was January of 2008 when I was very close to finishing it and I was excited about it and I was, was praying, having a quiet time with the Lord and He impressed on my heart that this book could not go forward until I reconciled with my father. Because for years we had not talked to each other. It was just a strained relationship, very difficult. I held a lot of resentment and anger towards him. And of course there was the sadness that came with thinking about him and the holidays and the things that he had done uh, while I was young. So um, I just questioned God. I said, but Lord, I, I've been trying to call him for years and he's not returning my call. So how am I supposed to reconcile? I said, well, if you want us to reconcile then, I guess I just have to leave it up to you. It's your move, Lord. It's your move, it's your move. And so I just spent the next several months praying, asking God, you know, Lord, what do I do? Will you please bring this reconciliation about if this is truly what you want? And lo and behold, I was able to uh, contact my father. Now, didn't it first come with a phone call from his brother? Yes, out his of the blue? brother called me. I hadn't spoken to him for years. Uh -huh. And he, we carried on a conversation as if we had just spoken to each other yesterday. And he told me that he loved me, he was proud of me, he cared for me. And this startled me, it just surprised me. And I thought, well, maybe if my uncle still loves me, could it be that my father loves me too? You know, even though I hadn't talked to him in, in years. So I got up the nerve and I called him. And I left a message for him. And again? Again. And I remember being so afraid because I wanted to say the right things and I was nervous and I wrote down every single thing that I wanted to say so I could say it perfectly on the machine just in case he didn't answer. And of course, everything went out the window. I fumbled through this message and told him that I was going to be in town, in his hometown where I wanted to talk to him about some things. And I said, I understand if you don't want to meet with us, but if you will, I, I, I'd appreciate it. The boys and I were coming down. So he called back. Had he ever seen his grandchildren? He had seen his grandchildren, oh, yeah. uh, but it had been many years before. They were young, so they were at a different stage of life. And uh, sure enough, he called back and said that he would. He said, I'd love to see you. And he actually took the day off of work, went to the museum with us, spent the whole day with us. Mm -hmm. And it was awkward because I feel like I don't really know him. But towards the end of the day, we got more familiar with each other. And finally we sat down and I kept saying, Lord, okay, when do I talk to him about these things? Because um, in January, when I first realized that the Lord wanted me to reconcile, I wanted him to own up and, and confess and tell me why he did what he did. Mm -hmm. But the Lord changed my heart in such a way that by the time Thanksgiving came, when I saw him face to face, that all I wanted to do was to tell him, Daddy, I love you, I forgive you, and I want you to be part of my life. God was right there. Right there. In that hole. We've got a great photograph. You've got to see this now. Your, your mom and dad actually married, mm -hmm. divorced. Yes. And remarried. Remarried. Yes. Um, they are not, not together married. They're not today. together. But uh, this is your mom yes. and your dad. Yes. And dad. as a result of my father and I reconciling, they were able to reconcile as well. So there was healing for all three of us. And I just, I would never think that God 
would do this. I am in such a better place. I am singing Christmas carols now. <laughs> I am decorating the no tree. No more depression at Christmas. Right, you know, it's just amazing the transformation that God has done as a result of me following his word, following his directive, forgiving my father, mm -hmm. not holding on to that grudge and allowing God to do his work. You know, we had Neil Anderson here, mm. uh, bondage breaker, yes. author, many other books. Yes. He says everywhere he goes in the world, he does a survey. How many people in the audience, in the congregation, know that you have someone in your life you need to forgive? Mm. He said consistently, all over the world, 90% wow. of the hands go up. It's very telling mm -hmm. and a very powerful reminder of the importance of forgiveness if we want to enjoy yes. God's best in our lives. Yes. Now I want you to see what I didn't expect to see and that is this woman in action oh, at goodness. her peak. Where are we going? <laughs> Where is this? This is the 1989 National Championships. Uh, we were competing at the University of Georgia. This is my bar routine. And uh, this is actually the team competition. That's a release move. And I do another release move here. And uh, the bars, actually, they have to raise the bars extra high for me because I'm five foot seven. And my feet literally drag the floor anytime I swing through the bottom. You do see your height here. Yes. When, when we're used to seeing this in uh -huh. a competition, you are a tall girl. But I'm a tall girl. Wow. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Wow, oh. you got a little fallout from this career. Your body yes. screams a little bit. It screams a little bit, yes. More oh. than I would like it to scream. I have um, had several neck and back injuries and it plagues me. You know, on the, on the plane ride here, I had to wear a back brace so that I could sit here with you without a back brace and not be in pain. But I guess that's the price I had to pay but I wouldn't change a thing. <laughs> I would not change a thing because God has done such an amazing work in me as a person and the growth that I've experienced, even through the pain, God is it using is it. It is a wonderful story. Unfavorable Odds by Kim Hamilton Anthony. And did you know when you were little that your name means beautiful hope? I did not. I did not until I started writing the book and I, I was doing a name search and I said, I wonder what my name means. And for the longest time, I, my middle name is Nadine, which is Hope. And I wanted to get rid of that name. Mm -hmm. I said, mom, I'm changing my middle name. And she's, no, honey, this is the name I gave you. It's my middle name as well. And I looked it up and once I found out it meant beautiful hope, I said, hey, this is it. This is All God's plan. of God's oh, plan. Gracious. Thank you so much for coming and Maura, sharing for with us me. today.